Okay, we'll just wait a few seconds to let everybody in before we begin this webinar. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar, Gender, Musical Transformation and Assyrian Weddings in Stateless Diaspora. I'm Alexandra, the Executive Director at the nonprofit organization, Assyrian Studies Association. Our mission is to promote the academic study of the Assyrian heritage through supporting research, teaching and intellectual collaboration among scholars in various fields from around the world. I'm also excited to announce that ASA has a membership where you can enroll to support and help us sustain our programs. To do so, please visit our website, assyriansstudiesassociation.org. Before we begin this webinar, I would like to acknowledge and thank our sponsors, Assyrian Foundation of America and iStorage for their support, our generous donors who make programming like this possible, and lastly, would like to thank you, our attendees, for joining us today. I would also like to mention that if you have any questions for our speaker, please refer to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or the chat button. Questions will be entertained after the presentation as a courtesy to our presenter. Now I would like to introduce our speaker, Lolita Emanuel, who is joining us from the beautiful Sydney, Australia. Lolita is an Assyrian and Armenian musician born on the Carabagul Island, excuse me, Carabagul land in Western Sydney, Australia, and navigating many worlds. She is a pianist, vocalist, musical instructor, and academic researcher. She is currently a Doctor of Musical Arts candidate at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. Lolita's experience as a performer spans across different genres of art, folk, R&B, and hip hop, and across different venues, such as the Art Gallery of New South Wales, Sydney Opera House, the Metro Theater, and North Byron Parklands for Splendor in the Grass Festival. Her work as a performer and researcher is actively inspired by her experience as a young woman in stateless diaspora, with a current focus on Assyrian art music, performance and feminist ethnomusicology. In 2019, she made her performance debut in the US as an accomplice and soloist with the Assyrian Art Institute's Assyrian Women Ensemble. Lolita is currently an academic tutor in musicology at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music and a keyboardist for the hip hop artist, Ryan Clapham, AKA Dobie's Waramagoo River Story Project. Lolita, thank you for joining us today. Assyrian Studies Association is honored to have you and to learn about your research. Thanks so much, um, Alexandra. And thank you to, um, well, to you, first of all, for that really awesome introduction. Um, and thanks to the Assyrian Studies Association for having me here. It's so exciting to share um, my research that I did um, with Assyrians for Assyrians. So um, yeah, I'm really glad to be here. Um, thanks to everyone who has registered and has showed up. It's so great to see so many um, names on the participant list on the Zoom. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to start today, um, firstly, to, um, to first recognize that I'm Zooming and researching from the land of the Dharuk people of the Eora Nation, who are a First Nations group that are, that are indigenous to um, this country, so-called Australia. Um, where sovereignty was never ceded. Um, and if you know the name of the Indigenous land that you're Zooming from, I encourage you to share it in the chat. Uh, I think wherever we are, it's, it's important to, to know um, what land we are living on and um, sharing ideas on as well. Um, <clears throat> so today I'll be talking about research that I did in um, 2018 and I have this little slide here that talks a little bit about who I am, but Alexandra introduced me so beautifully, so I won't go through that again. Um, but what I will add actually that, you know, all of these experiences um, that I've had as a performer and a researcher have really shaped the way that I think about um, music and my, my future research as well. Um, you know, as an Assyrian, I think a lot about the power of performance um, of course, as a performer, I think a lot about the power of performance as well. You know, historically, 
music and performance has been a space for Assyrians to express themselves um, and represent themselves where, you know, they've been denied the platform in other avenues. And so I think quite a lot about the potential for the performance space to be transformative and to be a place to enact the kind of change that you want to see in the world. So um, this is a little overview of how I'll be walking through my research today. Um, I'll start with some background on the research. Um, and then I'll go into talking about a feminist approach to diaspora, which is the kind of um, framework that I'm bringing to, to this research. I'll talk about generation um, and introduce a concept called motility, which I'm um, quite interested in and working on in my current research as well. Then I'll go on to share my research themes and then wrap it up before we have some questions. So back in 2018, um, when I was an undergraduate at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, I did my honours thesis on Assyrian wedding music and gender identity in diaspora. Um, the thesis was called uh, Shamiram Singh's Negotiating Perceptions of Young Assyrian Australian Womanhood Through Wedding Music. And the research data largely emerged from a series of focus groups that I held with six second generation young Assyrian women living in diaspora between the ages of 18 and 25 years. And although this wasn't the particular criteria um, when I was recruiting research participants, most of these women were either studying or had finished degrees at universities and were all born in Australia. And so um, over three weeks, uh, with these women, we gathered in an Assyrian community space in Fairfield, which is where a large population of Assyrians um, live. That's the Kabrogal land that I was born on as well. Um, and we spoke about Assyrian weddings and wedding music. And really that was the lens through which that we can, uh, through which we could discuss gender, cultural identity um, and diaspora in general. Um, but, you know, really this research was driven um, by my own experiences and observations as a young Assyrian woman living in diaspora. It came from a place of curiosity and scepticism, really. You know, at the time, there were many public discussions, which are still ongoing, um, about cultural survival in diaspora. And in particular, our generation, we're hearing repeated messages from older community leaders that young people are not engaged and that the culture will die in our generation. And that's a pretty you know, intense and kind of scary thing to kind of think of and, and, and grapple with. But what was really interesting about these public discussions was that there was this kind of paradox or contradiction. Oftentimes these conversations about young people were dominated by older men and lacked actual youth voices. So, you know, we were talking about young people, but young people weren't in those conversations. Um, and what this meant was that there was very little room for the experiences and perspectives of young people, and especially more marginalized youth, like young women and um, queer youth and um, youth with disabilities, uh, to be heard and understood. Um, now, I do want to mention that since doing this research four years ago, there's been a huge shift in um, our transnational community dynamics. And I think a lot of that has to do with the internet um, and COVID, especially really pushing us into using the internet as an alternative space to gather and to um, share ideas and talk about culture. Um, I think, I mean, what we're doing now even is a demonstration of, of how useful the internet has been to Assyrians. And there's heaps of research actually that talks about how Assyrians from the early 2000s have used the internet as an alternative home, like a virtual Assyria. Um, <clears throat> but returning to this research, um, these generational tensions and um, gender tensions were on my mind, right? So I turned to the research on diaspora to help me understand the Assyrian Australian community dynamics. So traditional understandings of diaspora usually focus on what's called the home and host binary, where the concept of the homeland 
is used to bind together a dispersed community who live in host countries um, around the world. In general, with this understanding of diaspora, there is a strong emphasis on geographical roots and an eventual return to the homeland. Now, for the Assyrians, the concept of the homeland is a little bit complicated since returning is oftentimes dangerous or not possible at all. Over time though, our understanding of diaspora has become a lot more complex and nuanced. And many scholars highlight the importance of understanding diasporas on their own um, and appreciating the diversity of these communities whilst moving away from this home host um, divide, this, this way of thinking that um, oftentimes, you know, by juxtaposing this um, idea of the homeland culture with those living in host countries, often produces really essentialist ideas about culture or authenticity. You know, this idea that the homeland is this fixed entity that's not evolving. And aspects of that homeland culture are diluted or lost when people migrate into the host countries. Now, feminist researchers argue that these ways of thinking about diaspora are also very male-centric and only privilege the perspectives of men, which in turn generate these assumptions that diasporic culture is primarily formed or constructed by men. Unfortunately, this neglects and oversimplifies the very um, particular and complex experiences of marginalized groups within diaspora, like women, queer people, and people with disabilities. Instead, they've introduced the concept of intersectionality which highlights that the experience of living in diaspora is shaped by various intersecting power relations relating to race, class, sexualities, age, nationality, religion, able-bodiedness, and so on. You can see over here, there's heaps of, of power relations that can be examined. <clears throat> um, and these aspects, firstly, make up who we are, but can position us in our communities with certain levels of power. Now, this was a really important contribution to diaspora studies because first, it brings to light the diversity of experience whilst living in diaspora. And it also emphasizes that diasporic culture, like culture in general, is complicated and it's constantly evolving and under construction. Um, this term intersectionality and the, the concept was first coined by an African-American um, civil rights lawyer and researcher called Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, who in her experiences as a lawyer representing black working class women in the US court system, argued that women are subjected to multiple sets of discrimination that occur simultaneously. And so she brought this intersectionality concept to illuminate the very particular experience that black working class women um, have. A final point that I'm gonna make on intersectionality is that these power relations and the way that they intersect with each other are not fixed and their, uh, their importance and their arrangements can actually shift and move depending on time, space and scenarios. I think this is really essential when we talk about cultural survival because it helps us see that while the threats to our communities and our cultural artifacts are very real and are also intensified by the lack of a nation state, which you know usually comes with a centralized institutional power that can support and fund um, cultural survival and um, cultural production. Assyrian culture is actually far from dead or dying. As long as Assyrians are living and identify as Assyrians, it's a living and evolving culture that's constantly being constructed. So, Given that my research um, was on young people in diaspora, analyzing generational differences as an intersection was um, essential in my approach to diaspora. Um, on Versetris' 2005 multi-generational study of the Swedish Assyrian diaspora found that young people often grapple with two or more sets of cultural expectations and values and often negotiate homeland and um, host country values. A lot of the time, this leaves them alienated 
both by Swedes, so people in their host country who see them as foreigners or others, and by people in their own communities who believe that by acting too Swedish or assimilated, they are betraying or turning their backs on Assyrian culture. For women, this is even more complicated since they not only have to balance home and host values, they also must live up to multiple expectations around gender, expectations within their own generation as well. So really, young women are under even more pressure to reconcile their complex identities. So basically, after understanding the state of play um, of Assyrian diasporic community dynamics, I landed on this question in my research, and it's a question that I'll be exploring today. How do young women navigate, challenge, and or reshape community dynamics as they seek connection with Assyrian culture in stateless diaspora? Or basically, what are the community dynamics or forces at play that shape young women's ability to connect to Assyrian culture? To help break this um, question down, um, I want to introduce another concept called motility. Um, it's actually a concept that's already in use by Assyrians in the real world. Um, actually, I think it's something that Assyrians are very good at. Um, and it's a concept that I'm currently working on my doctorate studies on Assyrian art music performance. It's something that I found when I was searching um, for a musical response to what Sargon Donabed, an Assyrian scholar says about how Assyrians are understood in both academia and the world generally. Um, you know, he says, too often we hear about what has been done to Assyrians, but really we don't, we don't get to celebrate or hear what Assyrians have achieved. Um, and so really this, this approach is emphasizing a theory of Assyrian perseverance. Now, back to motility. Um, the term motility actually comes from biology, right? So it's a word that's used to describe the capacity of a cell to be mobile. And it was borrowed by sociologists who have kind of conceptualized and defined it in this way. It's the capacity of a person to be mobile or importantly, how an individual or a group appropriates what is possible in the domain of mobility or the context of migration and puts this to use for their activities. And motility can be broken up in three components. The first one is access, um, which can be defined as the possibilities offered within a context or a certain condition. The second is skill, which is the acquired knowledge and um, one's ability to execute. And access and skill are combined together and they're, they're kind of potentials that are transformed through the process of appropriation by individuals or groups to achieve certain community or individual goals. Um, What's important to highlight is that these decisions and appropriations are often shaped by the values and the goals that are important to individuals or groups. And I think this concept of motility is actually a really powerful way of demonstrating Assyrian resilience in the face of cultural and existential threats. And it shows us that however displaced Assyrians might be, Assyrians continue to demonstrate creativity, um, and inventiveness when constructing Assyrian culture in diaspora. To give you um, an example of what Assyrian motil motility looks like, um, I want to tell you a quick story about Assyrian music in the British Royal Air Force Base of Habaniya in Iraq. So following a traumatic period of war and genocide, Assyrians were relocated to Habaniya. Um, where the British Royal Air Force base was operating. Um, there was a community of Assyrians that lived here from the mid thirties to the mid fifties. And it's in this space that a new Assyrian musical style emerged, a style that's actually quite influential um, in uh, Assyrian music today. It's in this space that Assyrians formed Western dance bands 
And I just want to remind us of the concept of motility here as, as I talk about this. In Havania, Assyrians suddenly had a lot more access, access to Western instruments like the violin, um, banjo, the drum kit, saxophone, um, and so on. And they were taught how to play them by Assyrian levy military musicians um, who had already established the, um, a military marching band. And so along with these new skills, Assyrian musicians who were already experienced music makers and um, expert storytellers appropriated popular Western dance tunes by translating their lyrics, um, so the lyrics of these uh, Western songs, into Assyrian and performing them to Assyrian audiences. And this was super popular. There was a high demand for bands at this time. Um, they performed at Assyrian weddings, events and parties, and they even performed for non-Assyrian audiences in Iraq as well. And eventually this actually shaped Assyrian musical practices music uh, moving forward. Um, at the same time, the Zurna and Dawula musical practice, which you know, is the double-headed drum and the um, woodwind or the reed, double reed instrument musical practice that we hear in Assyrian uh, music, this actually remained. So this didn't kind of go out of practice, but a new musical style emerged alongside it. I really like um, telling the story because it shows us how in the context of migration and displacement, Assyrians were able to pick up whatever tools were around them and use them to express their Assyrianness. It didn't matter that these instruments weren't authentically Assyrian. You know, this was Assyrian creativity and um, inventiveness and resilience at its peak. So what does this have to do with Assyrian weddings and gender? So there's two main reasons why I chose weddings as my point of focus in this research. Number one, um, Assyrian weddings are a powerful demonstration of Assyrian motility. First, Assyrian weddings are important to our community, not only as rites of passage where family attend to celebrate the marriage of their children, but uh, because we like a nation state, Assyrian weddings take on another function. They become community events that um, act as a vessel for the continued practice of Assyrian culture. In this way, Assyrians have actually appropriated weddings to suit community and nation building goals. Um, and you know, there's uh, lots of research, actually research by an Assyrian ethnomusicologist, Nadia Yonan, um, about the ability for Assyrian weddings to um, form and maintain transnational connections and how Assyrian artists actually move through different Assyrian diasporic locations by attending weddings and performing the same Assyrian music to these audiences, therefore connecting these um, communities together through music. Um, Assyrian weddings are also educational sites um, for young people to learn about and engage with Assyrian weddings, uh, Assyrian culture. Um, my second reason for using this as a point of focus is that weddings and music um, and the music performed in them can actually tell us a lot about community dynamics and gender expectations. Music is often used in diaspora weddings to assert stabilize and destabilize gender norms or identities. By attaching certain gender roles to performance, like you know, how someone should sing, um, what instruments a particular gender should play, um, or how a particular gender should dance or move, diaspora communities can assert what they think is representative of their cultural identity, or in other words, what they think expresses their Assyrianness. However, these gender roles are oftentimes a way to maintain the status quo or to control behavior. And it's actually something that's regularly contested by people in diaspora. So this, along with um, the idea that weddings are super important to Assyrians, makes weddings a really interesting space to examine um, hidden tensions and acts of resilience. And when we bring music and motility into the mix, we can understand the role that music has in restricting or enabling our capacity to be mobile. So this is the concept of motility, right? 
our capacity to connect to Assyrian culture. So like I said before, Assyrian weddings and wedding music were used in the focus groups as a point of discussion about gender, um, diasporic identity and cultural preservation. And one of the first things that we spoke about was a very popular wedding ritual and song called Hey Muyalan. So there's actually many verses to this song, but I've just shown you the chorus here um, as it's sung by the Assyrian artist Linda George, since um, most people tend to be familiar with this part of the song. Um, it's a ritualistic song that's regularly practiced across transnational um, diaspora, and it's performed during the Palatat Kalu ritual, which translates to the exit of the bride from her family home um, during wedding festivities. Outro. Yeah. Um, traditionally, Assyrian wedding rituals span across multiple days, but in diaspora, they can vary in length depending on families. Um, in the Palatid Kalo ritual, the Zurna and Dawula, which um, has, is traditionally and historically performed by men, feature alongside the groom's family members who sing Hey Muyalan. Um, Traditionally, or by custom, and, and we can see here in this excerpt that I found um, online, that um, uh, by custom, the bride and her family are not permitted to sing or express joy, um, as the act of the bride leaving her, uh, her parents' home is perceived to be a sad occasion. But by contrast, the groom's family rejoice with music and ululation, or galgalta in Assyrian. Um, celebrating the new addition to their family. The performed aspects of this ritual um, are clearly distinguished by gender, right? You can see that the bride and her family are expected to act sorrowful, and the groom's family, prompted by um, the male performers of the Zurna and Dawula, sing and celebrate. Now, in many contexts, especially in diaspora, these rituals go through many changes and not all uh, rituals necessarily follow this script. So in um, our focus groups, I asked the young women what they thought of the depiction of Assyrian womanhood in this song and uh, ritual. They largely felt that the bride was depicted as a voiceless object and that the gender roles that are tied to and performed in this ritual present a, particular, a patriarchal kind of womanhood that conflicts with their own perceptions um, of womanhood. You know, um, Abigail here, you know, she's saying uh, the bride in this song and, and in this ritual is, is like a prize. Um, Romina thinks that she is an object basically and she doesn't really appear in the song itself. Um, but when I asked the same group if they would include this ritual in the future, if they were to have their own weddings, they had mixed feelings. Um, Romina had been wrestling with this idea for some time already. You know, Domarina felt that uh, this tradition uh, or this folk song um, shouldn't be in practice still. Um, but Ishtar had a slightly different response, and I'm actually going to play to you what she said. You know, the lyrics, you know, as much as they're important, it's not so much about the lyrics, just kind of the sound um, and just the kind of community moment. I, I really think that we don't place emphasis on what the words are, but more so just the fact that we have these, you know, spoken or sung Assyrian words. Mm. And it's just something we can kind of, it's passed down generations. And it's, I don't think it's something that anyone really wants to change all that much. So here, Ishtar is telling us that despite this portrayal of the bride as a patriarchal um, agent um, in this Hey Muyalan song, which is a depiction of a Syrian womanhood that she personally doesn't align with, it's the nostalgic melody and the sung Assyrian words um, of Hey Muyalan 
as well as the community belonging that she's able to experience whilst singing the song that is more important to her, as it allows her to connect with the Syrian culture. You know, the lyrics... Now, these responses, of course, are not representative of every young Assyrian woman's view of gender roles in Hey Muyalan, but they show us how young women can simultaneously maintain conflicting or ambivalent views about their culture um, and gender identity. Um, this conversation about Hey Muyalan and gender in our focus groups eventually evolved into a broader discussion about the first key theme in my thesis which is a theme that manifests in the daily lives of young Assyrian women. And it's honor. So I use the term honor to refer to a kind of um, code of conduct or a set of rules that define certain social norms or moral codes that groups are expected to follow. More often than not, honor is connected to gender and sexuality and it's used to enforce particular behaviors and expectations. In our, discussion, um, in, in our discussions about the lives of young Assyrian women in diaspora, we found that honor dictates community expectations of young Assyrian womanhood and is constructed in highly contradictory ways when compared to community expectations for young men. Second generation Assyrian women feel pressure to maintain virginity until marriage. Um, but our research partners listed even more rules um, specifically for women um, that relate to curfews, um, household, uh, household chores, relationships with men um, and clothing. One research partner, um, and I use the, the term research partner as opposed to research participant, um, as the process of learning that we went through in our focus groups was purely collaborative. Um, so Ishtar actually uh, described her mother's perspective on this issue of honor. You know, she says, you have to act a certain way, not because we particularly care, but because we don't want everyone else to talk about us. So here, Ishtar's mother is deeply concerned with upholding honor due to reputation. Um, for Ishtar, Failing to uphold these aspects of honor would not only bring shame to her family, but in diaspora, prompts a loss of community belonging or Assyrianness that could distance her from her homeland culture. Ishad also spoke about her struggle to connect with young Assyrian men because of a clear double standard in her community's notion of honor. Mothers and fathers are stricter with young women, whilst younger men, like her brother, could get away with a lot more. This is, you know, this is a gender tension that might be familiar to women in many contexts, but a lot of diaspora scholars talk about how younger men actually prefer to maintain traditional values and gender roles since they mostly benefit them. But for young women, they are confronted with contradictions about their identities, which give rise to tensions between young people within generations. These intergenerational tensions, uh, tensions, sorry, intragenerational tensions, so the tensions within generations, can actually be seen through gender coded performance, um, uh, performance forms that favor young men. In Assyrian musical practices, Zurna and Dawula performance is often passed down as an oral tradition um, from older men to younger men, which in turn makes Zurna and Dawula performance a male dominated space. Um, there's a lot of research on performance and in musicology that reveals how gender boundaries are drawn by attaching musical roles to certain um, genders. Instrumental performance in particular is often seen as an honorable practice um, since it's tied to um, this idea of virtuosity and physical ability and skill. And since historically, um, instrumental performance has been a space occupied and dominated by men, they are often the people who are afforded that privilege and honor. But the Zurna and Dawula practice is not only important to men. In fact, for many Assyrians and for the young women in our focus groups, hearing the Zurna and Dawula was vital in establishing a connection to Assyrian culture. Umta um, in our focus groups, she was saying, 
uh, that she believes that Zubna and Dawula is one of the most important things of um, the Assyrian wedding uh, ritual and Assyrian wedding practices. Um, and it's the process of sonic association that actually connects young people in diaspora um, to, to uh, the homeland, right? So hearing the sounds of the Zurna and Dawula has this uh, symbolism, the sonic association to Assyria. Now, I'm going to play a little clip, um, an excerpt from uh, Dina uh, speaking about her own experiences with gender boundaries um, at her cousin's wedding. So Dina was um, another woman in our focus groups. Um, and I'm just going to play that excerpt now. I was just like playing it. And the lady comes up to me, this old woman. She's like, Dina, what are you doing in Assyrian? Dina, <clears throat> I'm like, you know, and she says in English, this is a man's job. And I'm just like, oh my God, it was, it was really embarrassing. So Dina's experience here shows us that these gender boundaries not only benefit and are asserted by men, but they're actually upheld by older women as well, which shows us how both inter and intra generational tensions arise during wedding music performance. Um, you know, Dina shared with us that she loves percussion and drumming. And the opportunity to play the dawula at her cousin's wedding was an important moment for her to connect with the Syrian culture. But these gender boundaries that push women away and keep women away from these musical spaces excludes them from experiencing community belonging. So, so far I've spoken a lot about the tensions and the challenges that women face when attempting to connect to culture in diaspora. But it's equally as important to examine how young women draw on their individual agency when making decisions during weddings. Um, I'm about to play some excerpts from an art film um, and documentary about the importance of weddings to Assyrian Australians um, and also the significant role that the cinematographer plays in documenting and transmitting wedding videos across transnational diaspora. Um, the film is by an Australian artist, um, Kate Blackmore, um, and it was commissioned by the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney um, in partnership with a Fairfield-based theatre company and Starts, which is a non-profit organisation that supports refugee communities and groups experiencing trauma. Um, there's so much that can be discussed and unpacked in this film, um, but for now, you'll be hearing from Nahren in this video, whose wedding features in the documentary. I think now with everything that's happened in Iraq, like in the last few years, I think people now more so are sort of holding on to what we had and what we have as a culture and as a nation. Um, in previous years, I would say that our, our, especially our youth were sort of more letting go of the traditions and even the language, you know, things like that, it wasn't really used. Whereas now that there's that threat that we're beginning to lose everything that we had, people are sort of grasping onto what they can and they're a lot more proud of who they are and where they came from. Little drum roll there. Um, what Nahren is saying um, here actually demonstrates this idea of intersectionality that I spoke about before. You know, the understanding that power relations and the way that they collide can actually shift depending on time, space and scenarios. In this case, the scenario is described by Nahrin as the ISIS attacks that occurred in 2014 across various Assyrian homelands, which intensified the existing fears and anxieties um, in a Syrian diaspora about cultural survival. It's this particular event that Nahrain says triggered a return to Assyrian culture for young Assyrians. You know, she says, now that there's this threat, you know, people are grasping onto what they can. Um, and, you know, I think this is, it's, it's really interesting actually. And what I'm about to show you is um, another comment that Nahrain makes, which actually demonstrates a form of motility. I'll just play that for you now. <laughs> <laughs> 
when you come from a place like Iraq, where especially for us as Assyrians, I think that there is always that feeling of not being able to be completely free to celebrate the way that you would choose to. Whereas over here in Australia, I think, I mean, for, I can speak on behalf of myself. I mean, now that I am planning our wedding, I want to show the world that we're Assyrian. I want everyone to see our traditions and our customs and things like that. So this reflection from the Han shows us that um, in a new context, Australia, she is able to appropriate the wedding tradition, not only as a space to practice Assyrian culture, but as an act of resilience in response to existential threats posed by ISIS in the Assyrian homelands. I think this is a really powerful example of Assyrian motility. Weddings and their cultural practices are repurposed and rearranged by young women as tools for enacting resilience. And um, by looking at the wedding planning process, you know, which involves deciding which rituals to perform, what clothing to wear, um, food preparation, and importantly, how the music is planned and curated, we can see how women draw on agency to shape Assyrian wedding music practices in ways that reflect their own diasporic identities. Um, to flesh out these forms of agency, I want to introduce a term that emerged um, in ethnomusicology called musicking. Drum roll, another drum roll. Um, which um, can be defined as taking part in any capacity in a musical performance, whether by uh, performing, by listening, by rehearsing or practicing, um, by providing material performance uh, for performance or for dancing. You know, these are all acts that contribute to the music making experience. And by looking at these forms of musicking, we can see how individuals assert their own cultural identity in diaspora. They can do this in a number of ways. They can do this by curating wedding performances, um, by putting together playlists that they believe reflect their own diasporic identity. You know, so sometimes um, in Assyrian weddings, um, you might hear playlists that feature Assyrian music, Western music, like um, top 40s or hip hop or pop music, as well as music from the countries um, that their parents originate from. So, um, you know, Arabic music, Kurdish, Iranian, Turkish, Armenian, so on and so forth. You know, a whole variety of musical cultures that can really reflect the experience of living in stateless transnational diaspora. And interestingly, it's these choices that can actually shape market expectations for wedding musicians and in turn can influence musical genres and performances. So I've included over here um, an advertisement um, by Ashwood Kings Entertainment, which is an Assyrian-run drumming group here in um, Sydney. And they're advertising um, wedding performance packages that feature um, musical performances with a variety of instruments. You know, we have the tambura, we have the saxophone, the violin, we have zurna and dawula. Um, you could argue that these performance packages are actually responding to the tastes of people living in diaspora. So overall, these musical examples show how women in planning the music at their weddings make these choices in ways that still facilitate connection to Assyrian culture, but can simultaneously transform cultural practice in diaspora. And I think this is another form of motility that highlights individual agency. So this brings me to the end of my webinar. Wow, we're at 53 minutes. That's what my presentation says. Um, today, you know, I spoke about one case study. And, you know, while this is not representative of the full spectrum of diversity in the Syrian diaspora, in fact, you know, some people are marginalized and others are completely excluded from Assyrian cultural practices and community building processes. Um, so again, while this is not fully representative of a full spectrum, we can still draw some general conclusions that can be applied to our understanding of Assyrian diaspora. Young Assyrian Australian women and broadly, stateless diasporic identity is complex, dynamic and evolving.
It's formed by many intersectional aspects or power relations existing at once, like race, class, sexualities, age, um, so on and so forth. And these power relations and the way that they intersect are not fixed. They can shift in their importance depending on time, space, and scenarios. It's this understanding of intersectionality that helps us see the various community dynamics that influence or shape one's capacity to connect to culture in diaspora. You know, the central um, anxiety at the time of writing this research, this was um, back in 2018, right? The central anxiety was that young people are not engaged and without the centralized institutional power that comes with having a recognized nation state, you know, something that can support and fund cultural production and continuity. The Assyrian community fears that our younger generations will not be able to carry the culture on to future generations. But as we've seen today, through hearing from these young women's experiences, firstly, young women, uh, young people are engaged, but also, you know, we are not whole without embracing the full diversity of our community, especially if we're concerned about passing the culture on to future generations. With the concept of motility, which is how Assyrians appropriate the available tools around them to suit community goals, we can see how despite these challenges and tensions, young Assyrian women demonstrate resilience and creativity and inventiveness in stateless diaspora as they continue to construct Assyrian culture. The women that we heard from today are tradition bearers. You know, they've inherited Assyrian culture, but they do tradition in new ways, ways that make sense to, um, ways that make sense with who they've become in diaspora. Um, wedding music practices are just one way that we can see this. Um, but again, like I mentioned before, so much has changed, you know, um, about how we connect as young people to Assyrian culture. Um, the internet, again, is such a, an interesting space to examine. And I think more research could be done um, to examine how young Assyrians use the internet. Um, <clears throat> and I think what's uh, super important is that um, the internet has provided more platforms and alternative spaces for marginalized youth to communicate and um, represent themselves. Um, and I think, again, this is another example of motility. Um, you know, the internet is used as a tool by Assyrians. Um, absolutely, um, I think that future research can be done to examine um, queer youth, um, refugee youth and youth with disabilities in terms of how they connect to culture. Um, in diaspora. These are all particular um, experiences that um, while intersectionality can kind of uh, pick up or help us understand the experiences of young women, um, these uh, experiences require uh, more research and um, more kind of research approaches as well to understand them. Um, and just going back to my point about the internet, I think uh, there's so much space for research to be done on how Assyrian women use the internet to challenge and um, subvert uh, gender norms, and in particular, how music is used to do that. And I'm thinking of this amazing video that I should share. If, if I can share it, um, I will. But it's um, it's called Brati, and it's uh, uploaded on Ramina Raided's uh, YouTube channel. She is an iconic a Syrian comedian on the internet. Um, and it's a parody um, or a remix of the song Bruni by um, the Assyrian band Azaduta. And it's it's a really, really clever way of using music to critique um, gender gender roles and Assyrian uh, and gender expectations for Assyrian women. So that brings me to the end of my research, but I just wanted to add a little shameless plug here. Um, if you'd like to stay in the loop for my future projects, um, open up your phones and um, scan this QR code to um, sign up to my um, upcoming digital lecture recital um, called Performing Assyrianness. I'll be performing some um, pieces that feature um, art installations that um, were created by an Assyrian artist called Diki Bato to illuminate these ideas that I've been talking about today.
resilience and motility. Um, and it's also a really um, important and interesting opportunity for me to hear um, the Assyrian community's feedback and um, perspectives on the research ideas that I share in this video. So it's not just a concert, it's an opportunity for dialogue with um, the Assyrian community. All right, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lolita. Um, your presentation and research is really, I mean, it was beautiful. And truthfully, uh, it was just so interesting to learn about this because I haven't, as an academic myself, I haven't read any research really about, um, about this specific connection between mortality, Assyrian identity and weddings yet. So um, this, was, this was fascinating. Um, before I move on to audience questions, and uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, feel comfortable to use the chat or the Q&A feature on Zoom. To, to ask your questions. Uh, but before, I have a few um, of myself that I wanted to ask Lolita. Uh, Lolita, so uh, first, how did you feel really about conducting this research since you are a Syrian and you're connected to Syrian culture? How did this make you feel when you, with the results that you found? Um, many, I felt many emotions. Um, it, I mean, so first of all, you know, the process of doing research with your own communities is, um, it's a beautiful process and it's also um, quite complicated. You know, there's constant discussions within research about insider research, you know, doing research with your own communities um, and negotiating that role as a researcher and as a community member. Um, and, you know, what's important with this process is to recognize your position in the research and the perspective that you bring to the discussions that you have, um, you know, recognizing my position as, um, yes, someone who is um, a young Assyrian woman, but someone who also has a particular perspective on Assyrian culture that may differ from, from others. But um, all in all, you know, the experience was very empowering and affirming. Um, and I think one of the most powerful research outcomes was the, the bonding that we all experienced in this um, focus group. You know, it was one at the time, um, it seemed like it was one of the few opportunities that we could come together in a safe space to um, share our experiences. Um, and it was um, a way for me to also learn more about my culture and my community. Um, and, you know, I'm so proud of the insights that emerged from here. You know, the, the, the conversations that we had challenged my own views um, about gender and, and culture as well. And I'm also proud to say that, you know, I'm still in great contact and I'm great friends with uh, the women in these focus groups. Um, so I think one other question I, I, I was thinking about as you, was as you were presenting was, do you see yourself really expanding this research, um, again, on mortality and Syrian identity through weddings, to include maybe another focus group in another country, uh, for example, um, maybe America or um, or in Sweden. I know you had some research that you pulled from from Sweden, but um, and you currently are in your doctoral program, so that's just a, yeah. I'm just pulling for 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 information from you. <laughs> yeah, um, I think it would be very very interesting and and would give us a more comprehensive. Um, uh, understanding of our transnational community by, by doing that, because, you know, like I said before, um, it can, uh, diasporic culture can differ from location to location, right? A nation as a, as a power relation can shape one's perspective on culture. You know, like for example, an Iranian Assyrian living in America might view Assyrian culture different differently to an Iraqi Assyrian living in Australia. Um, and so this would be a really op good opportunity to learn more about that. Um, you know, it, the concept of motility and um, gender boundaries and um, musical transformation, these themes still exist in my current research, which is, um, so the research is on Assyrian art music performance, but specifically searching for a new approach to the performance of this genre, which is quite small. Um, but, you know, thinking about ways to stage this genre that is engaging um, for Assyrian audiences and can connect and unite Assyrian transnational people. Um, and so, you know, the insights that I've drawn from this research helps me um, understand how 
um, you know, the development of new genres or newer genres like Assyrian art music um, might be influenced or shaped by gender boundaries. So there's a lot to, to unpack there as well. Definitely. Um, okay, so uh, for, for the sake of timing, let's go ahead and dive into um, the audience's questions. So do you think, um, do you know how gender boundaries are drawn in music within Assyrian culture? And do you think it'll ever involve? I guess, I guess they're, they're really just asking, um, you know, how, how, how did you find out that there is this gender dynamic behind Assyrian music? Um, well, the, if it's how did I how did I find out? Um, I think pro it probably came from. I mean, I think it's something that can a lot of a lot of times these um, gender boundaries are implicit, right? And they're kind of uncut. They're uh, they're not seen visibly on the surface, um, but it's definitely something that people can experience and notice and feel and observe. Um, I do think that my initial observation was probably um, influenced by my own experience as a musician in other musical spaces and noticing gender, um, particular gender dynamics in my educational experience. You know, the male domination of, of um, instrumental performance is common everywhere. At the conservatorium, for example, where I study, there's this constant discussion about, um, you know, virtuosity being attached to physical strength and, and male physical strength. And so um, it's something that I was hyper aware of in a performance context myself as a musician. Even, you know, thinking about in the, in the Assyrian community, one thing that I find um, interesting, and it's not actually exclusive to Assyrian communities, I've heard this everywhere. There seems to be an interesting distinction between musicians and singers. Um, and it's like musicians are, uh, singers are musicians, right? But why do we make this, this distinction? Um, and in the context that I've been, I've heard people tie that to gender, right? Women sing, men play. Um, so, yeah, I think that that kind of prompted me to think about these things in my own community. Yeah, that was a really interesting question because I, I was kind of thinking the same, like how do... I mean, we can visualize, we can see it too. Um, okay, so how um, so how could expansion of a pursuit of degree level education in the arts, particularly in music, among Assyrian youth, impact the dynamic of adaptive Assyrian culture and conscious awareness of cultural uh, evolution in the context you've discussed? That's a really wonderful question. Yeah, that is a beautiful question. I am such an advocate for um, Assyrian involvement in the arts. Um, and I'm just going to read that question as well, because there's lots of really interesting components. Um, yeah, well, um, you know, one thing that I, I said before is that music, Assyrians know that music is important to them, right, and, and cultural production and art. Um, it's a, one of the few platforms that we've used to express ourselves um, and um, and learn about ourselves as well. Um, and one thing that I talk about in my research is how Assyrian artists, like visual artists and uh, artists of very of many uh, mediums, use art in diaspora to um, construct and express Assyrianness. Um, and so I think that it can. Um, you know, equipping us with the tools to um, work with the arts, which, you know, can happen in university contexts, but also in other contexts as well. You don't necessarily need to learn about music or art at a, at a um, university. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it can, um, it's kind of like a form of motility, right? Um, it's a tool that we can use to suit our, our goals, like me. I'm using music and my degree as a tool to suit um, a musical pursuit, a research pursuit, and also a community goal, right? Because the research was a response to this discussion that, um, you know, um, about this discussion about our musical genres and how um, the Assyrian art music genre is small and there's this desire to, to continue to, to grow it and to develop more. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to answer this question, you know, to use research, to use the, the process of performance as a research tool to understand um, 
what can be done to create a genre that's engaging to Assyrians? Um, so, so one from the chat we have is, do you predict a shift in Assyrian Australian women's in involvement in cultural music performances and encouraging to welcome their contribution at performances similar to other cultures like the Lebanese Australian women, only Dawula band? Yeah, um, I think, I think so. Um, I mean, like I said, so much has changed and we, we can see so much continuing to change. Um, I think the more that we have these public conversations and the more that, you know, Syrian women resist um, and you pick up those dawulas and, you know, choose to dance or move to music in whichever way they like, um, we can see that shift. But, you know, at the same time, it's important to think about the, the, the people who provide access to these spaces. You know, who is in, who, um, yeah, who has... Who was the gatekeeper basically to this tradition and how willing are they to, um, you know, to communicate and to open up this space to all Assyrians? So I think it, it depends on that as well. And um, another question I kind of touched upon earlier um, was, are you going to be expanding this on your doctoral research? You definitely have answered that. So I'll, I'll just, thank you for your question, Nadia. I'll, <laughs> it was answered. <laughs> um, so another one we have is, do you think Assyrian music will continue to evolve or adapt in the way Assyrians in Habinia use the instruments available, um, available to them at the time? Do you see it happening at the moment? Could you briefly explain the concept of Assyrian art music that you mentioned briefly at the end? Yeah, yeah, um, excellent question. Um, I think that music, Assyrian music, like many musical cultures will continue to evolve, you know, whether we like it or not, um, you know, because music, like people, moves. Um, and that's something that, you know, I, I talk about quite a lot with um, Nadia Yon, and it's something that she said as well. And that is so, so true. Um, you know, as we move, um, music will always be with us. And something that I always say is that, you know, the Syrians, you know, our, our cultural artifacts and uh, our cultural artifacts may be destroyed. They might, um, you know, they might tear down our artifacts and ancient sites. But one thing they can't take away from us is song um, and our ability to sing and make music. And I think that's just a, a natural part of the human experience. So yes, I think it will continue to evolve. Um, and it's happening now. Um, Nadia is saying, and dance. Yes, yes, 100%. And music and dance are you know, intricately tied together. Um, in terms of Assyrian art music, so that's, this is something that I'm continuing to define, right? Assyrian art music is kind of like an open concept that I'm working with and hope to um, expand on as I share my lecture recital. So sign up so you can be part of that process. Um, it's, a, it's a term that I'm using to describe Assyrian classical music. Um, and the existing genre um, mainly centers around the works of composers like William Daniel, um, Polis Khafri, um, Malfono Nuri Iskandar. Um, and to, to, to think of um, William Daniel, who most Assyrians know, um, he used the approaches of Western um, composers. Um, in the 19th century, who are working with the style called the nationalist, the nationalist style, which basically involved taking what they believed was the essential or core um, element of a musical culture and reworking it through the tools um, and vernacular of Western classical music. So it was kind of like an approach that integrated um, Indigenous music into Western art music frameworks. Um, and um, so many of, a lot of the repertoire kind of exists within that kind of approach. Um, but, you know, art music can be, I think the reason why I use art music is because it can be broad um, and, you know, it's not necessarily tied to classical music as a, um, as an institution, you know, or Western institution. Although, you know, classical music exists in, in many different cultural contexts, 
So I hope that gives you a little rundown, but to hear more, sign up to the uh, <laughs> digital lecture recital. Uh, that was a wonderful answer. Um, so we have two more questions. Uh, we'll go through them. So um, as an Assyrian Armenian musician, uh, how do you, how, how do your findings on a Syrian community parallel with the observations of the Armenian community in the same field, if, if they do at all? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, <clears throat> in terms of personal experience, you know, I, um, I grew up mainly in the Assyrian community, um, but with a, a deep connection to Armenian culture through my grandmother, who was Armenian, and, um, you know, I spent a lot of time with because uh, she was taking care of me a lot as a child. And so I learned a lot about music and culture through her, but um, little about community dynamics because I was mainly in the Assyrian community. Um, but I think one thing that I will say is that the community dynamics, although, you know, Assyrians and Armenians have lived alongside each other and have many um, common experiences that they can share, the community dynamics are very different largely because Armenians have a nation state. And I think that gives them a particular um, kind of access or, or type of power that differs to Assyrians. Um, so, yes. Oh, I think you're on mute, Alexandra. The old Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I know it's like that was like the, the one phrase everybody said in 2020. Um, <laughs> um, so this is our, our last question, unless somebody has one more. Um, so thank you for your most excellent lecture, Lolita. Thank you also for creating a safe space for Assyrians, especially women, to speak of such experiences. I imagine working with an indigenous transnational community who is still under threat and makes such research uh, precarious at times. So my question is, uh, can you speak a bit about how mu uh, musical cultural production can create an artistic and intellectual notion of home, perhaps like nostalgia that is transnational, but also become problematic when it focuses on some regions and not others? Yes, um, really, really great question. And I'm just opening up the question to look at all the different components. Um, Yeah, so that second half about, you know, how it can become problematic when it focuses on some regions and not others is something that I'm really interested in, especially in my doctorate research, um, because of the way it connects to nationalism, um, you know, the way that in, uh, Indigenous cultures are homogenized in the process of um, nationalism, right? And, and even this idea of Assyrian um, identity is tied to nationalism too. And so, you know, how one question that I constantly ask myself is in uh, developing an approach to Assyrian art music performance, right? A style um, that's called Assyrian art music and is tied to um, uh, nationalism as well. Um, how can, sorry, one thing I will add also is that my approach also looks at decolonial approaches to classical music. Um, and that, that's really important. So that, that's that's why I'm asking this question, right? How can we approach this in a decolonial way, in a way that doesn't um, homogenize the regional differences um, and the, the beautiful diversity um, and tapestry of sounds that we have in the Assyrian community? Um, and I think it's, it's a really complicated question um, uh, that I am I'm still kind of grappling with and continuing to ask. Um, yeah, I think in terms of um, how musical production um, can create an artistic and an intellectual notion of home, you know, I kind of spoke a little bit about that um, when we were talking about, um, you know, the sounds of particular in instruments being representative or symbolic of a uh, homeland. Um, but also Nadia Yonan, an excellent um, ethnomusicologist, talks about the wedding space um, as a temporary site for um, a Syrian nation building. And so, you know, I like to say, or I like to think that, you know, stepping into a reception hall can feel like stepping into a temporary Assyria. Um, and the sounds that are created, the movements that are made, the discussions that are had, the way we move, the way we, you know, ululate and shake our yelachiate, the, 
the handkerchiefs, with the coins, um, can um, all kind of constitute a form of nation building as well. But yeah, it's a really good question. I'm I'm still working through those ideas in my research as well. Definitely. Um, so now I'd like to, uh, we reach really the end of the webinar and I wanna take this opportunity to thank everyone who joined us today um, for wherever you were coming from. I know we had a lot of people from Australia, from America, um, and I wanna thank them. And in addition, I wanna thank our speaker, Lolita, for your fascinating research that really connects mortality, a concept that was quite new to me and Assyrian identity through weddings. Um, before everybody goes, I also wanted to share an upcoming webinar that will occur on June 27th, that will occur on June 27th with um, coordinators of the upcoming Assyrian Genocide Exhibit at California State University, Stanislaus. Um, if you're interested, you can definitely register by visiting our website, assyrianstudiesassociation.org. I also encourage you to become a member of ASA to support our programs and also to subscribe to our email so you can stay up to date on upcoming webinars, events that we'll be having in person next year, hint, hint, and grant opportunities that are upcoming, especially the one that we have, um, which is the Assyrian Academic Research Grant that will open on July 1st. Um, Lolita, again, thank you. Uh, I don't know if you if you have anything closing you wanted to, to say, but I wanted to give you the last word. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this um, opportunity to share my research. It's it's so great to share this in an Assyrian space. Um, and I um, want to thank everyone who sent those questions. Those were really awesome questions. And it just shows that, you know, as a community, we are really interested and passionate about community um, building and, and, you know, music and you know, every single person in our community. So I, I just, I hope to see um, even more um, discussion and research about, you know, these tensions and challenges that I spoke about, um, and especially things that can, well, discussions that can represent um, other people in, in diaspora that I haven't spoken about today. Of course, yeah. And um, one last thing, we also, I wanted to, um, send a thank you from on behalf of uh, Assyrian Studies Association and to extend a future webinar and events with you. And um, again, thank you. And thank you everyone for your questions and for joining. Uh, we hope to see you again.